And just last year, she completed developing a best practices guide to increase the use of native trees to improve urban forest resilience here in Tucson. She is also now working on drafting the urban forest master plan for the city of Tucson. So we will have a few announcements, I think. Uh, no, let's, let's wait. We're, we're all warmed up and ready here. And we'll save the announcements to the end. Anne's got a great slideshow. She'll stop in plenty of time for question and answer. And Anne, um, welcome to Sustainable Tucson's monthly meeting. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm, I'm glad um, uh, people are interested in this topic. It's something I'm pretty excited about. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I wanna point out that the presentation that I'm going to show you is available at this website, tucsoncleanandbeautiful.org uh, slash native hyphen trees hyphen four hyphen Tucson. So you can get um, this entire presentation. It's available there along with a brochure a poster and a summary of this presentation. So you don't, don't feel like you have to jot everything down. And I'm just gonna jump in here. So this um, is covering the topic of 10, trying to get this to advance here, there we go. Um, 10 uh, best practices and we'll go over those in the presentation. So uh, a large number of people contributed information and this project was funded by the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. And uh, we'll just jump right in as Stuart reviewed. We've got a lot of problems and challenges climate wise. Um, we also had a lot of die off of um, in particular, Aleppo pines and eucalyptus um, during that really hot uh, year. And you, you can see here an example of an Ale a dead Aleppo next to a, a live mesquite. Um, at the same time, we need to conserve drinking water, but there are parts of Tucson with very low canopy coverage. Here's an example of low canopy coverage. Here's an example of a residential area with high canopy coverage. Um, the, the work at the city to um, the Tucson Million Trees Initiative is an attempt to increase the equitable coverage of tree canopies throughout the city. So, but we, at the same time, a lot of people go, well, you can't have trees because we have to conserve water. So how do you reconcile those two needs? We'll talk about that. <clears throat> One way to do that is to concentrate on trees that naturally grow here. And um, in this, uh, in our recommendations for trees to use in Tucson, we include both low water use native trees and medium water use native trees. And if you sort of imagine the cross section from Tucson, um, from the flats and the low elevation Santa Cruz River and washes up into the foothills and a little higher, you'll see that um, our native trees distribute themselves according to the availability of water. So the low water use trees generally are on the flats. When they are present in uh, ephemeral washes or intermittent washes, they, get, they tend to get bigger and the species composition changes a little bit even amongst the low, low water use native trees. Medium water use native trees tend to be at higher elevations and in areas with more consistent water supply like Sabino Canyon. Um, native trees have natural adaptations to our drought um, cycles and our extreme heat. And one of those adaptations is that if you leave a native tree alone, particularly the low water use natives, they have a very large canopy. They drape their canopy around their trunks. They cool the soil underneath that draped canopy. Now you don't often see this tree shape because normally in urban areas, these are pruned up so you can get underneath the trees, but that's what they naturally wanna do. Another adaptation is that native trees um, will often you know, drop leaves if it gets too hot and dry and they can't support them, they'll just shut them off and drop them off. And this is a canyon hackberry in a hot parking lot that has in, in that, that really rough June we had, went ahead and started going drought deciduous. That's what we call it. 
So it's not winter deciduous where the tree naturally cycles and drops its leaves. It's actually a response to heat and drought. Another adaptation is that um, some native trees and this is a foothill paloverdes uh, doing this particular adaptation. It will self prune some of its branches and even some of its multiple trunks if it cannot support um, all of those, all of that uh, tree mass. So in this case, the tree has selected this path for water. This trunk and this branch off this trunk are still alive. It has self pruned a secondary branch and it has self pruned, self -pruned one of its multiple trunks. That doesn't kill the tree. It does make it, you know, sometimes a little misshapen, but the tree itself survives to reproduce. Um, and uh, there are many of our native trees also have velvety leaves that reduces the amount of UV stress that's created on those trees. So they're naturally adapted. Now, um, one of the ways to deal with that conflict between trees and water is to provide native trees with harvested water, which uh, means rainwater, stormwater, gray water, and condensate water, um, because that's basically created in the urban environment, essentially for free. I mean, the rain falls on us, the stormwater runs off our streets. We spend millions of dollars getting rid of it instead of harvesting it. Now there's much more emphasis towards harvesting it. Um, and uh, we create gray water all the time from our washing machines and our air conditioners create a lot of condensate water. So when that water is applied to these low water use trees, they grow a lot faster than they do in the natural environment, just on rainwater alone. So um, even, you know, allegedly slow growing trees like ironwoods, which these do illustrate, actually grow very quickly in the urban environment when they get that extra water. This guy, this tree is only 12 years old. There's the carport roof. There's the house roof. And you see how big that tree is. Um, most likely the owner said it's probably found the septic leach field, which is not necessarily what you want trees to do, but it does illustrate how rapidly they can grow. This ironwood is getting water from a street curb cut. Native trees provide um, many, many benefits other than being able to withstand heat and drought. They're nurse trees, they provide habitat to our native wildlife. Um, they're beautiful and they provide um, you know, traditional building materials and they have many other benefits. So here's um, a list of the 10 best practices. I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in on these. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the water because that's really essential. You know, there's no point in planting a tree in Tucson if you haven't figured out how you're gonna provide water for it because even the natives need at least three years of watering to some degree to get established, particularly in the hotter, drier months. And if you want a native tree to provide the broad canopy and the dense shade that will cool our urban environment, you actually want to tend to give them a little more water than they would get in the natural environment. So we get what 11 to 12 inches of rainfall per year. Um, you know, a low water use tree in the urban environment, if you want it to have that bigger canopy and a denser canopy, we recommend giving them about 20 inches of water per year. For the medium water use trees, they need about 35 inches of water per year. So what does that really mean? It means for a 10 foot wide tree canopy, a low water use tree, that's about a thousand gallons of water. And you can see the wider the canopy, the, the amount of water increases um, relative to the width of the tree canopy. Um, and the medium water use trees, a 10 foot tree needs 2000 gallons, a 30 foot tree needs about 15,000 gallons. Now, how are we gonna provide that water um, first and easiest way to do that is simple rainwater harvesting. And if you harvest off a paved surface, you get quite a bit of runoff off that surface. 80 to 95% of the rain hitting a hardscape that's sloped towards a tree will run off and benefit that tree. If you're harvesting off bare soil, the runoff is more like 35 to 55% because uh, a large portion of it actually infiltrates directly into the soil. 
So what does this mean in terms of rainwater harvesting? How much of an area do you need to harvest water off of in order to support these kinds of trees? And for low water use trees, if you have a paved surface, uh, we recommend about a three to one catchment ratio. So that means you have three units of area that catch rainfall, and that includes the direct rainfall over the tree. So to get three, three to one catchment ratio for this low water use tree, you have two units of the rooftop or um, two units of sloped land to one unit of, of tree canopy area. This is the mature canopy size of the tree. And um, if you have a, you know, say a parking lot where you're running water from all directions towards that tree, just visually, that's about what it looks like. That's about what it looks like on a sloped surface. That's about what it looks like on a rooftop area. And if it's just an earthen area, you need a seven to, seven to one catchment ratio. Now these pictures are not designed to make you get out your calculators and your spreadsheets. You don't really have to do that. They're, they're shown this way to um, give you a mental image of what you want running towards your tree. Medium water use trees need larger catchment areas going toward them. A five to one catchment ratio for hardscape and a 13 to one catchment ratio for earthen areas going toward these trees. Now, in order to get, you, you can't, you can harvest rainfall, but you can't put that in a little one, you know, you can't put it in a little tiny depression, right? So the depression that will hold that water generally needs to be at least about 12 inches deep and pretty broad, you know, preferably the width of a mature tree canopy, although it doesn't have to be quite that big. So that's just a, some sort of mental pictures to work with. Now, over a year's time, um, even with the native trees, if you look at this blue line, this is the month to month water demand of a low water use native tree, assuming it needs 20 inches a year to meet urban uh, tree standards, aesthetic standards. Um, at the same time, um, this is the rainfall. But this is how much, I, maybe I said that wrong. This is the rainfall month to month. This is how much water the tree needs month to month. Okay, and with a three to one catchment ratio for low water use trees, you see that because we get so little rain in April, May, and June, even when you concentrate that rainfall, you really don't get enough to meet the high demand in those months to maintain that aesthetic standard. So there's a deficit for low water use trees and high water use trees. And this means uh, other types of water may be needed to support that tree other than just rainfall, um, rainfall runoff um, in order to maintain that aesthetic standard for the tree. And that's why it's important to address the use of gray water and condensate water to help support trees. And we'll uh, work with these concepts a little later. But rainwater, rainwater harvesting looks pretty much like this. You want to collect all the water you can, put in a tank if you, if you have, you know, you can afford it and you want it, although it's actually very cost effective to just create depressions in your earthen landscape and harvest water directly into these depressions. When you do that, you want multiple depressions that zigzag across the landscape. The more time, and the more depressions that water passes through, the more water infiltrates into your soil to support the trees. So rather than having this one depression coming off this house into this tank, into this depression, rather than having that overflow from that go to the street, have the overflow from that basin zigzag across the site. And here's some examples of simple ways to harvest water just a, a, a simple depression in the ground with water coming directly overhead from the rain and flowing in from the slopes nearby. In a parking lot, simply lowering the dirt level inside of a curb will at least retain the water that falls there. If you have a sloped landscape, you can run that water down a gentle slope and collect uh, additional rainwater by building up little crescent-shaped berms on the downside of the tree 
In this case, they're armored with rock. That just makes them last longer. Um, you, but you can make depressions without rock. In this case, water is running off a sidewalk into depressions. So it's pretty simple to do. Um, one thing I recommend though, is don't go dig these in May and June when your dirt is really dry and it's hot. Wait until the monsoons start. Um, that way the soils will start to be moistened up a little bit. There'll be a lot easier to dig. You could throw a hose down in, in, you know, in the hot months and wet the soil that way, but that's not effect as effective as just letting the rainfall infiltrate. And um, then, you know, go, go take a try at it. It's, it's not rocket science and there's lots of sources of information about this. At the, the last page of this um, presentation and the book, if you go get the PDF from the Tucson Clean and Beautiful Rebs website, has a lot of resources for that. Um, one important thing is you, the berm should be about four times as wide as it is tall. So this is not a speed bump. It's a speed hump, okay? And the hump is what you compact. You compact the berm. You know, it's impossible not to step into the bottom of the depression, but don't stump around and compact that because you want that soil left very loose and aerated so water can easily infiltrate. Here's some other patterns. Raise the places where you walk. Let the water run off those raised places and infiltrate into adjacent basins. You can walk, uh, walk water downhill with a series of sort of uh, scallopy berms and catchment areas. You can create wide swales and walk the water down there. The more water you collect, the more important it is to create a spillway, a designated spillway to lead the water safely across that berm so that um, it can fill the next swale on the way down. If you don't create a place for water to overflow, it will find its own way to do that and it will probably create erosion. That's why you see um, some rock armoring on here to facilitate that overflow. And here's some examples of um, wet, wet basins on a terrace is going down and a large wet swale, which does have an overflow, but you can't actually see that in the picture. So um, stormwater harvesting is just collecting that water that collects on roads and large parking lots. And it's sort of the water that we don't own. As residential users, we, you know, we're entitled to the water that falls on our roof and on our land. Once it hits common areas or big commercial properties, it tends to become a stormwater management problem for the city. But increasingly, um, people are harvesting, for example, street runoff and parking lot runoff. And there's lots of creative ways to do this, perforated or permeable paving. This is actually permeable paving at the target facility on Oracle Road, Oracle and Wetmore. Doesn't look like porous paving, but these are actually bricks set on top of a metal framework. And the water can infiltrate between the, brook, the bricks and into the root zone of the trees. So gray water, um, lots of information about that and many different sources. Some caveats on that. If you have a water softener, do not put the gray water on your plants. That's a little too much salt for them. You don't spray gray water and um, you don't put gray water on the leaves or edible parts of a tree. And if you got washing diapers or things like that, don't put that gray water to your landscape. However, there's a lot of creative ways to use gray water. You do have to use the right soap. And um, it's very important when using gray water to also be harvesting rainwater in those same basins, because that will help to dilute the salts that do appear in gray water. Even though if you use the right soap and stuff, the, the salts are not too intense, you still wanna go ahead and dilute those to some extent. So combine that with rainwater harvesting. Condensate is, um, uh, you know, sort of a little understood and very underutilized water resource. So I was living in a house and I noticed water was pooling uh, through these little downspouts. And it took me a minute to figure out what that was. That was the condensate water that comes off your air conditioning coils. So if you have a glass of ice water in a humid month, 
the water collects on the outside of that, right? What happens in an air conditioner when you have those cold coils, you know, that you're cooling, water condenses on that. And normally that condensate water is just discharged, you know, with the sewer from your house. But in some cases where it drips outside the house, you can go out and collect it. So I put a measuring cup under that. And I found out that in August, that was generating over 30 gallons of water every 24 hours. So that's a lot of water. And I hooked up very simple little connectors here, ran a hose over to a tree and started using that on the tree. Some caveats on this, um, I, a lot of javelinas would traipse around that site. <laughs> so if I wasn't there, I'd pull this apparatus off because if the javelina happened to trip on this hose and kink it, that water would have backed up into the air conditioner uh, and that would not be good. So there are, you know, you, if you're gonna use condensate, there's some right ways to do it and some wrong ways to do it. This facility at the University of Arizona is um, all of these native trees, which go from low water use to riparian um, cottonwoods and, and, you know, really high water use trees are supported by a combination of air conditioning condensate and rooftop runoff that's collected in an 11,000 gallon tank inside this building. So that shows you the power of rainwater harvesting and condensate water harvesting. Obviously, the more humid it is, the more condensate you get. So July, August, September, that's when we get most of our condensate. But if you're running your air conditioner all year, um, like a big building would, likely they are producing some. Tanks are great, but you don't have to use a tank to harvest rainwater. So I'm just gonna skip the tanks other than to say that they exist and that the city of Tucson is on water, has a great rebate program. If you want to get a tank, check it out because if you're a Tucson water customer, you might qualify for a, a, a quite an extensive rebate on that. Now, look at the difference here, an aerial photo. This is um, Sonoran co-housing on the left and a, a standard sort of multifamily complex on the right. And pretty much, you know, this probably has even more hardscape, meaning roof and parking lot than Sonoran co-housing. But Sonoran co-housing was designed to harvest all the rainwater and stormwater. And in addition, there's probably some gray water harvesting going on there. Now they do do some supplemental irrigation, but you can see the difference in this dramatic landscape, how shady that is. A lot of these uh, are edible trees or produce edible products compared to kind of a standard, um, you know, raised landscape type complex. And these, these trees are actually, that's a mound. Those trees are on mounds. This tall eucalyptus has, has died since this photo was taken. So, um, you know, it, that's the power of it. And if we do that citywide in Tucson and we use both low water use and medium water use trees, we can create uh, broad shade canopies over our urban areas because we're getting the water anyway. Now, in this, this vision here, the light colored trees are in the areas like street medians and street sides and broad parking lots where you don't have that additional gray water and condensate water source. The medium water use trees are clustered around how residential sites, big commercial sites, downtown building, things like that, where gray water and condensate water are available. And um, that's a strategy that uh, I see manifested a little bit in the city and it's something we should do more of in the future. So now I'm gonna walk you through some native trees um, so that you get to know them a little better. By the way, this is a, a, a native ironwood, uh, desert ironwood tree, and it's showing its seasonal patterns. Ironwood trees are, um, are not winter deciduous, they're winter evergreens. They have leaves all winter. In early May, they start to drop leaves and they bloom and the leaves stay off the sort of a barren canopy throughout June until the monsoon rains come. And then the canopy comes back very densely. So that's um, a beautiful native tree adapting to its, our seasonal patterns. Here's more about the ironwood tree. It's a multi-trunk tree. Here's its natural form. 
If you try to turn that tree into a single trunk tree or um, aggressively prune it, you've basically made it useless in terms of creating shade. And unfortunately, extreme pruning is not uncommon with the native trees. Here are just some of its characteristics. Um, it's low water use, so it just needs a three to one catchment ratio. This can become quite a large tree. So you see here a 20 foot telephone pole and a six foot man to give you a sense of the scale of this tree. You do not plant these trees under power lines, right? Because that tree is gonna grow really tall and it's gonna have to be massively pruned or removed if you put it under a power line. And this is the most fascinating thing I can think about for ironwood, excuse me, ironwood trees, that these trees live a thousand years or more. So if you plant an ironwood, you're creating a legacy for many, many, many years ahead. Just give them enough room. And um, I, uh, your pictures are in the way of me right now, so I'm gonna make it so I can't see you. But I hope you can see here the natural range of the ironwood tree. Um, you'll see here this approximately models where the Sonoran Desert is. Tucson is on the uh, eastern edge of a lot of the Sonoran Desert. It's much hotter and drier as you go west, which shows you that the ironwood um, is, as we get hotter and drier in Tucson, the ironwood is going to be very well adapted for that. Its cold tolerance is down to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, some people are concerned um, that ironwoods, um, you know, in freezing temperatures are going to be damaged. Typically in the urban environment, even if you get a cold temperature, you've got enough mass left in the asphalt to keep the tree relatively warm. And it is drought or cold tolerant down to 20 degrees. Um, they are thorny, especially when they're young. So just be aware of that. They, once they get um, mature up, they're easier to deal with, deal with those thorns. Um, velvet mesquite, everybody's pretty familiar with this tree. Here's its natural form. See that broad sweeping canopy, multiple trunks. Here's an unfortunate extreme pruning. Um, they do support native insects and wildlife and they, they produce a lot of food for Tucson. They have a moderate to fast growth rate, growth rate even in its natural conditions. And by the way, the ironwood is listed here as a slow rate. Usually these growth rates are listed for natural conditions. Those ironwoods do grow faster when they're in an urban environment with a little more supplemental water. Um, mesquites have a very large, large range. They live for 200 years or more. They have many adaptive qualities and they can get really quite large and quite wide. Foothill Palo Verdes like to be in well-drained soils. That's why you tend to find these in the foothills, um, you know, with uh, where there's better drained soils, soils rather than in lowlands. But they can be um, they can be placed in water harvesting basins. They're typically slow in natural environments, but I've seen them growing really fast in parking lots. Here's their natural form. Here's an absurd prune, one of the most ridiculous prunes I've ever seen. Um, their, their thorns are not really intimidating. They do create edible seeds. Now the pods themselves are not edible, but the seeds are. Uh, certainly they have a beautiful display. They have a large range, again, paralleling the Sonoran Desert. Again, a very long lifespan. And they are, they don't get as tall as the mesquite or the ironwood. Um, although this particular specimen is pretty tall. So I'd, I'd be a little bit hesitant to put those under a power line. Um, and a three to one catchment ratio works for them. Blue Palo Verdes are a larger stature tree than the foothill Palo Verde. These tend to grow in, um, in uh, ephemeral, you know, very um, lowland desert riparian areas. They like to be next to the water, but they don't want to be in the water. Um, here's their natural form. They're a beautiful tree. They're actually the state tree of Arizona. 
And the seeds inside these pods are edible. Um, go to Desert Harvester's website if you want to find out to harvest, how to harvest and utilize these. Um, three to one catchment ratio, a little shorter lived, although 150 years is a pretty good lifespan. There are, there are some issues with uh, blue paliverdes in Tucson right now. They're getting a lot of witch's broom. Um, they're hoping to find out the cause of that. But since they're the state tree and they're beautiful and they're, they create dense shade, we're still recommending using them. Catclaw acacia might be a tree you may not be familiar with, but if you want to catch these trees in action, keep your eyes out because in the next few months, these are going to start to green up and get seeds on them. And this is Speedway. This tree is in the medium, uh, median at, on Speedway, uh, sort of east, you know, between like Tucson Boulevard Country Club area. Um, they're pruning up very nicely, even though their natural form is very low, very scrappy kind of tree, likes to grow along washes. Um, and you can't really turn them into a single trunk. I've seen some single trunk trunks turn out. This one didn't turn out too good. But um, if you keep them multi-trunk and you keep them pruned up, they create very dense shade and they are super, super hardy. Um, in that the spring of 2020, 2020, that was so brutal. 2021 was so brutal because 2020 had almost no rain. These guys greened up, put on seeds and performed brilliantly even with only like five inches of rainfall that previous year. Moderately fast growing, wicked, wicked little seed uh, spines on these things. They call them cat claw and they mean it. These guys are spiny, but they can be pruned. And over time, um, the branches will stay spiny, but the trunks stop being spiny. And very large range and um, uh, somewhat slower, lower lifespan, maybe a hundred years. But in truth, a lot of these native trees, they're not really sure what the lifespan is because they don't, um, uh, like the tree ring laboratory can't really give me much information on lifespan because they don't have the typical sort of, uh, you know, winter deciduous tree goes completely dormant. Then in summer, it puts on the leaves. So the Eastern trees, there's a very distinct gro growth pattern for those. Whereas for the uh, low water use native trees in the Sonoran Desert, it's not as distinct. It's a little harder um, to date them. And plus they have multiple trunks. So that makes it kind of harder too. A palabrea is from um, the Northern Mexico part of the Sonoran Desert. So it is a Sonoran Desert tree. Lots and lots of these are, being, are growing in Tucson right now. They're kind of interesting because they look like a they have a very bony sort of interior with a very thin skin on it. These, as with all California trees, um, do their, their, their bark is photosynthetic. It's very, very tender bark, and it doesn't get woody and shaggy the way non-photosynthetic bark does. They have a very um, interesting kind of eccentric branch pattern. Um, they you know, you can make them single trunk if you work at it. They have thorns, but they're not very intimidating. Beautiful flowers, um, 150 year lifespan, and they're still low water use trees. They tend to have a somewhat smaller stature than some of the other trees we've looked at. Although you'd still wanna be careful with, with them under power lines. Um, this one is at the University of Arizona in a parking lot. So it gets a lot of irrigation. It's getting kind of tall up there. Um, cold tolerance, these, because they're um, from a lower, uh, you know, lower latitude in the Sonoran Desert, they have a cold tolerance down to 25, which means if you get an overnight freeze, it's not going to kill them. Um, but they, you might want to be careful and plant them where they get, um, you know, they're not, don't put them in a cold air drainage, like don't put them in the bottom of a wash. Um, a white thorn acacia is another native, um, broad form, pretty kind of uh, airy foliage, doesn't really create dense shade. Although this is three white thorns planted next to each other and they do, the combined shade is fairly dense. 
pretty, uh, you know, prominent thorns and um, not edible as far as I know. They do have a large range, short-lived, relatively short-lived. So I have seen some of these trees in their later stages of life, They're, they get infested with mistletoe quite a bit. They are moderately fast growers, but the, one advantage of these is they do stay pretty small. So this might be an opportunity if you have power lines and you want some extra security, nice thorny tree like this, um, something you could put along your back wall, something to enhance security. Um, desert willows are just amazing, wonderful trees, very malleable in terms of shape. Here's their natural form. Here's a well-pruned one. Here's one that's been pruned against a wall and uh, you know, to dodge a power line, not a great idea, not really a good placement for this tree, but you can, you can manipulate the shape of these trees quite a bit and they just keep growing and growing. Beautiful pollinator species, 150 year lifespan, very large range and fast growing. So this is a, a real great tree, cold tolerant to 10 degrees. Now we're getting into the medium water use trees here. And um, the Canyon Hackberry is a really great uh, medium water use tree for Tucson. It's a very broad, dense canopy. Here's one in its natural form. It's, it does have a single trunk. It's just kind of a young scrappy tree. As that gets bigger, it will broaden out like this and you should be able to walk under it pretty easily. Charismatic bark pattern, really an interesting bark pattern, sort of a, a rangy characteristic branch pattern too. You can't quite tell from this one, but these branches just go hither and yon um, in a really interesting way. They get uh, edible berries on them and the uh, wildlife loves them. The flowers are pretty in, in, uh, innocuous. You don't really see them. I had to try really hard to find them. <laughs> when I took this photograph and then they were very small. Um, drought tolerant, excuse me, cold tolerant to 20 degrees. Now you start to see here that we're getting into a range where Tucson is on the Eastern half of that range. These are higher elevations with um, more mountains, more water. So Tucson is sort of the Western range for this tree. And um, let's see, yeah, don't put these guys under power lines, it is long lived. And what I really appreciate, appreciate about these trees is the density of the shade. And they're just um, really great character, characters to have around. Um, scrubbing mesquite is, uh, we often think mesquites are always extremely drought tolerant. However, scrubbings are actually riparian trees. And you see here their natural range, a little bit around Tucson, and you see them um, on the Colorado River and tributaries to the Colorado. So these trees like more water. Their natural form is very sprawly. Um, they are winter deciduous. There's, you see here one that people have worked with. This is outside Woods Library. They're trying to shape it into a good canopy tree. Um, these trees are pretty challenging to work with pruning wise, um, but they are pretty interesting trees. They have shaggy characteristic bark, um, wonderful seed pods that are edible. They're thorny, you know, as all mesquites are. All of the mesquites are nitrogen fixers too, along with the desert willow and um, extremely cold tolerant. When you're in these cold air drainages, trees have to be cold tolerant because cold air will come off the mountains, sweep down into these drainages and pool in the drainages. And so only a cold tolerant tree would be able to really uh, grow there quite a bit. They don't have a really good uh, lifespan information on screw beans, but uh, tree, ring, tree ring lab and some of the botanists I talked to thought they were probably a hundred years and probably more. Um, this is a kidney wood, which is a riparian, uh, well, a higher elevation tree. You can see its natural range is in the mountainous, you know, more foothill, mountainous ranges, you know, up canyons with more water, um, cold tolerant to 15 degrees. This is a sort of a well-behaved tree. Here's one at the university that hasn't been overly pruned, 
So you get a sense of its natural form. Here's one that's been pruned to work around buildings. Um, interesting trunk pattern. Uh, lots of wildlife attracted to these trees because they have beautiful, um, uh, sweet smelling flowers, um, nice shady leaves and seeds to eat. Moderately fast growing, sh but unfortunately short lived. But when I say short lived, I mean, most people think, well, if it lives 50 years, I can plant that and I will get the benefits of that tree. And that's very true. So um, can tend to stay small. I, you know, you might want to watch it. It does have sort of a vertical form. But um, this is uh, what some people consider to be a, quote, patio tree, more of a landscaping tree, no thorns. And um, just you just need to get it, make sure you're getting in enough water, moderately fast growth. This is an interesting native tree that not everybody knows about, um, Arizona rosewood. And it's basically a big ball. Many, many trunks. This one has been pruned up ever so slightly to try to, you know, get in a, under it a little bit. This one is at Sonoran Co-Housing. It's been rather brutally pruned to try to create it into a head shape and it. This was not a very happy plant. Um, but if you, if you're, you know, if you want something, for example, an oleander type function, a, a hedge type plant, a windbreak, this is an excellent tree to use for that. It's um, pretty showy flowers and the seed pods when they come on, I think are pretty interesting. Nice leaf shape, um, you know, 50 years or less lifespan and um, slow to moderate growth, but I've seen these grow pretty fast when they find the leach fields. And again, here you see that they're, they're you know, slightly higher elevation in more riparian um, areas, um, very cold tolerant. So interesting tree, and it's a native. Um, the feather tree or Lysoloma, it's just a gorgeous tree. Um, the more of these I see around Tucson, the more impressed I am by this tree. Their habitat is, is into Sonoran, into the, the um, Mexico part of the Sonoran Desert, and also native to the canyons and uh, slightly higher elevations around Tucson. But all of these are in Tucson, you know, all these are growing in Tucson. This one's at the university. This is at St. Philip's Church. You can see it going through different um, seasons. Um, yeah, this one's multi-trunk. You can sort of encourage them into single trunk. Beautiful um, flowers, gorgeous foliage, beautiful seed pods, very interesting long seed pads, pods, moderate growth rate and Short-lived, but I don't know. Um, you know, I imagine this tree's been at St. Philip's for a long time. And so I'm not really sure what these trees start to look like when they when they reach the end of their lifespan. But these older trees that I saw looked looked pretty, pretty healthy. And it is a nitrogen fixer as well. So finally, a little leaf ash tree. We included the ash, um, the small version of the ash because it's um, another, you know, it tends to be a single trunk tree, although that, that one's multi-trunk, but you can sort of encourage them into a single trunk form. They fit in narrow, small spaces. They, have, they don't have thorns. They can be a shrub form. They can be a tree form. Um, they have nice foliage. Uh, the shade is, is, you know, reasonably dense. You can see on the shrub form there, it's dense. This one I think is maybe getting into the fall. So it's starting to lose some foliage. Um, Southern Arizona range, cold tolerant, 50 year lifespan. Although I think sometimes when people aren't sure what lifespans are, they tend to default to 50 years. So we'll see. Slow to moderate growth rate in its natural environment, could grow a little faster with supplemental water. One challenge of ash trees is that they're somewhat vulnerable to insect pests. And um, they even they're even though they are adapted to extreme heat to some extent, there has been some loss of ash trees in Tucson, including the velvet ash, which is our the native Arizona ash tree. Um, so uh, if they if they suit your needs, it could be a good choice. Um, 
might run into, might encounter some problems, but it's a, it's a good choice for some functions and it, there's no thorns on it. So the native trees, this is their bloom patterns and their basic bloom colors. This is information you can use in terms of when the pollinators will be around to serve these trees. And let me get back here. Um, okay, so we've been talking about trees, but it's very useful to plant native understory plants at the same time you plant trees. That creates more shade on the pavement. In the natural environment, uh, this one is an ironwood tree along a sandy wash. It naturally, a lot of native understories grow under it. In the urban environment, here's a multiple native trees with understory under them. Um, so the more water these trees get in terms of a wash or gray water or condensate water or harvested rainwater, the denser they grow together. So normally we think, well, put your trees so that their canopies don't overlap. But you see in nature, and in the urban environment, they, they can overlap to some extent if there's sufficient water. When they do overlap, you get a much more dense shade canopy from that, from the trees slightly overlapping. So you don't necessarily want to plant them right, you know, five feet apart, but if they're, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet apart and they grow together, that's probably okay if they get enough water. And the more understory there is, the more diversity um, for native wildlife and insects and pollinators, and it just creates a much denser shade canopy. So these is, this is a bloom calendar for a list of recommended native understory plants, shrubs, vines, um, a succulents and cacti, and this is their bloom patterns. So if you want, if you're interested in what kind of natives you might want to plant in association with your tree, um, this is a good list to start with. There's many, many more native understory species. So now if you're ready to plant, you want to think about what, what do you want to accomplish with this tree? Do you want um, year-round shade? Do you want um, shade? Um, just on the north side of your house because you have solar panels on your house and you don't want to shade the south side? Do you have kids around and you don't want a lot of thorns or is it okay to have thorns? What kind of utilities, um, overhead utilities are going on that you need to be working around? Do you have buried utilities you need to skirt around? Um, so this particular spacing is a little too close together because you see these, you know, we're looking at little trees, right? So you plant them 10 feet apart. Well, that looks okay because they're pretty small. But when their canopies get that big, that's a little too much overlap, perhaps. So you space them out a little farther apart. You can, you know, figure out, look at, look at those, the tree characteristic pages, and you can see what the size range of that mature tree might be. And plant your understory shrubs at the same time and under, under other understory, spe understory species at the same time, because then they all grow up together and you quickly, you, you much more quickly get shade over the soil. So here's a list of things you might wanna consider. Um, watch out for the buried lines and the overhead lines. Now, if you're planting on a right of way, you can call 811, this number, and they will come out for free and use the spray paint and mark where your utilities are going from the street to your property line. So they will mark the public right of way. They will not mark inside your property line. If you wanna know where the buried lines are there, you will have to hire a private utility locating service unless you have a plot plan and, or unless you're reasonably sure where they are. Um, so be, you know, be really leery of that. I've um, encountered some buried lines when I was digging and uh, fortunately nothing bad happened. Um, <laughs> Did you mean to say 911? No, it's actually 811. 
Okay. Yeah, it used to be 911. 911 is like, that's like emergency, right? 811 is for bur buried utilities, as that's far as blue, I know. The former blue state? Yes. Got it. Exactly. Yeah. And now this was a couple of years old, so you might want to double check that number. But that's, to my understanding, that's that's a number. Okay, spacing. Be careful around corners. If you're getting close to corners and you start to block a stop sign or block, an, uh, you know, a person is trying to turn turn the corner and they can't see, that tree will probably be need to be taken out or extremely heavily pruned. So just don't don't plant in areas that might in the future be impacted because you're blocking street signs, street lights, or the visibility that cars need. Um, now, in terms of solar, in, in terms of our sun and our shade patterns, um, right now we're getting pretty close to the spring equinox. So you may notice that the sun, so we'll look at this equinox one here right now. The sun is still, we're not quite there yet. So the sun is still rising a little bit in the north. But during later in the day, it's getting farther in the south. You know, we're starting to get light coming in the south windows and then setting just a little bit farther um, from uh, due east, you know, just a little bit in the northern sky. Um, but that's going to change quickly. And we're going to be working our way toward the summer pattern. So in the summer, the sun is rises really far in the north and gets just about straight overhead at noon and sets pretty far in the north at night. So when you're trying to get maximum cooling shade for your house, getting trees on the east and the north and the west side of your house is really important and even around to the southeast and the southwest, because that's the hottest time of year. And that's when the sun is gonna be hitting you from the north side. You also want trees on the south side for maximum shade, because for example, at the spring equinox, when the sun is in the south at noon, you're gonna want shade on the south side of your house too. You know, April can be really hot. We know that. Um, so if you're not worried um, about solar panels, you can plant trees on the south side of your house. However, plant deciduous trees. That way in the winter, so here's the winter pattern. The sun is rising in way in the southeast, getting really deep in the southern sky at noon and setting in the Southwest. Now you want, both of these are this, this winter solstice pattern. Now, um, if you don't have solar panels, you get a, just a minimal shade from bare trees on your house. So you're getting some warmth coming in your Southern windows. If you have solar panels, you really don't want these trees in the way of your solar panels. So in that case, don't plant on the south side of your house. So these are this is something to take into account as you determine where to place your trees and which trees you want. So note that you can save 20 to 30% of your energy costs by getting trees planted around your house and shading your house. So um, once you figure out, now this is sort of a water harvesting layout for a certain site with a certain slope. And um, in this case, they're using the rooftop runoff, coming down a gutter, going into these basins. It happens that, that the slope goes toward the, the north end of the house. And at the same time, they're also collecting water in a rainwater tank. They have an air conditioning condenser and that condensate water is being used. There's a gray water outlet behind the house. So you think it through how you're going to use your water, look at the slope, figure out where you want to put basins. There's a whole long process to determine water harvesting design, which I can't really cover here. But Brad Lancaster's books are excellent for this, and there's a lot of other resources for water harvesting. And then go ahead and plant your trees accordingly. So um, here, 
On the south side of the house are drought deciduous trees, cat claw, velvet mesquite, kidney wood, and the lysoloma all drop their leaves in the winter. So now you've got good access to your house to warm your south facing window in the winter. On the north side, you have the huge drought tolerant trees and um, the ones that can take the wind, they can take the heat. And um, in the case of a canyon hackberry, we place that in the back as a pretty large stature tree, but the reason it's back there is because it can get the gray water from the house. So you're utilizing the gray water there. You're use, utilizing tank water for the lysoloma and the kidney woods, two trees that need a little more water. And the condensate water is going to these. So just think it all through. Think about how you're gonna do it. And be careful when you pick your trees out because native trees, um, and in particular, when I was working at the rest, doing habitat restoration with Tucson Audubon, we grew out our own native trees and we did it in two foot tall, four inch diameter PVC tubes. The reason we did that is because those native trees have a fast growing taproot. You can have a six inch tall little mesquite seedling and that taproot can be 18 inches deep. So when you grow those kinds of native trees out in pots, that, that root tends to hit the bottom of the pot and start coiling around. So the bigger the pot size you get, the more likely it is that you're gonna have um, a coiled root or that the, the roots might be root bound. If you can buy, if you're able to buy trees in tall pots that aren't very tall, those are pretty healthy trees. Um, this happens to be a wholesale nursery and you can't always at the retail um, level buy these tall pot trees. But um, if, when it is possible to get them, go for those. And um, uh, by the way, a lot of our native trees will self-seed. So you may go out after the monsoon season and see a bunch of little seedlings in your yard or in your right-of-way. If those trees are in a good place, you can put a little, uh, augment their slopes a little bit to give them a little more water harvesting and go ahead and support those volunteers. They have very good root structure. Um, anything that grows from seed, the, root, the roots do what they naturally want to do. They're not impeded by a pot. And finally, um, be careful. <laughs> Just a pet peeve of mine. Um, a lot of things called velvet mesquite in nurseries might actually be hybridized mesquites. They've hybridized with South American mesquites, which are very common in Tucson. So if you want a true velvet mesquite, go feel the leaves. They will literally, the underside of the leaf will feel like velvet. That's how you can tell if you're getting a pretty good quality velvet mesquite. Blue uh, Palaverdes foothills and Palabreas also hybridize. So um, try to be careful about where you get these trees and um, hopefully you can get some that are true natives and not hybrid hybrids. Uh, by the way, Desert Museum hybrid, short-lived, and I've seen some of those become senescent. I mean, get to old age in Tucson in parking lots and they're, they're pretty gnarly looking. Um, try to get the natives. They live longer. Um, they're, the foothills in the blue Palo Verde have edible pod uh, seeds, not the pods. Um, so try to get the natives. And it's a good idea to harden your plants out. If they've been babied too long in a nursery under a shade cloth or something, you might want to gradually harden them out so they're ready for the, the sun. Okay, now you're ready to plant. Um, plant your water at the same time you plant your tree. So you wanna think through your water harvesting and start to prepare the basin that the tree is going to go into. Again, a 12 inch deep basin that's, that's um, fairly wide, you know, significantly wider than the, the certainly the young tree canopy. Um, will collect quite a bit of water for you. Uh, I think we've talked about some of this. Um, if you do, if you're planting in the right of way um, or in an area where you have a, a narrow planting space and you have to make a deep, steep-sided basin, array your rocks 
so that they poke up a little bit above the side of the basin, not so much that they impede water, runoff water coming in it, but so that they mark the margins of the basin. So because these are basically tripping hazards. So you want people, you want people's eyes to key into the presence of these um, deep basins with steep sides. Also, the, the large rocks around those steep sides help to stabilize those. Be careful when you're digging around existing trees. Um, they have shallow roots. And some of those roots, if the tree is very drought stressed and you get in there and you disturb those roots significantly, it could create some problems for the tree. So be a little bit careful about that. Try to make sure adjacent trees are well watered and try to avoid digging around their roots. Again, make sure you check for utilities. One thing that's important when you're doing water harvesting basins is to get your trees up on a pedestal so that, um, and this can be done by making a terrace a, you know, at the side of the basin or a pedestal inside the basin. And the reason for this is that um, most trees, including our natives, don't particularly wanna have their trunks base of their trunks inundated for long periods of time. Most of them can tolerate, you know, a, a few hours of inundation. But you can see here in this basin in a really high flow event at this water level, the trees in these positions will be inundated for a little while, but that water will quickly infiltrate down and um, you'll, the trees will, will you know, the, the bark will dry out and the trees won't be too bothered for, by that. Now, in all honesty, I've put in a lot of water harvesting basins at restorations and sites, things like that, in the bottom of basins, not on pedestals. And most natives can take it to some extent, but it's just good best practice is to put them up on a pedestal. So here's an example of two different strategies to, to plant making basins for your trees. You got a little tiny tree and you know what the mature canopy size might be, you can dig a nice wide basin that will you know, support that tree you know, when it's uh, mature. But if you do that, you need to put a little donut shape closer to that tree. Here's the root ball. You want a depression closer to that tree that will lead that water so that it's adjacent to the root ball and that water will seep through capillarity over to the root ball, right? If this were flat bottomed, that little tree might not get enough water, particularly because it's on a pedestal. So that's one way to do it is build a large basin to begin with, or you could build multiple small basins. This tree will eventually get to that size. Now these smaller basins will be infiltrating water that that large tree will utilize. Although the volume of the capacity of these basins, of a large basin like this is certainly larger than these, these little mini basins. But if you create enough mini basins around your site and you get that water infiltrating, you know, you got, it's like a cupcake pan. You know, you got multiple places water can infiltrate if you have a cupcake pan pattern. And wherever that tree grows, any, any plant will seek out the water. It'll, it, it will grow toward the water. So, um, you know, this tree, when it's big, will have its roots over here utilizing this water. And I'm just watching the time we've got. Okay. It's just going on 710. I want to make sure there'll be time for a yeah. few questions. Yeah, we're getting pretty close to the end. All right. So um, if you've got caliche, and this hole did, um, you need, you're going to need to punch through and you can, you know, try to crack it. You can literally dig through it. I, I whacked through a bunch of caliche last summer. In fact, I dug this hole, um, finally bought myself a digging bar at the age of 70. <laughs> you know, those caliche digging bars, <laughs> um, and punch through till I got good infiltration. So you want to check your infiltration before you plant your tree. You know, if you have to put in hose water, do it. This happened to have a, it was a good monsoon last year and I got enough rain. So I could go out and take it, figure out how long it took for that water to infiltrate. 
I try to get that water pretty much infiltrated within two to three hours is my personal goal. Um, and it, you know, if you punch through the caliche, you got a pretty good chance of that. So um, this guy came along happily to put in the tree hole with a jackhammer and that helped a lot. <laughs> so I appreciated that. Um, so be careful about that. Make your hole about two to three times as wide as the root ball of your, your plant. So if your root ball is like this, two to three times as wide as about like that. But the depth should be equal to the bottom of the root ball because that root ball needs to sit on some good sturdy dirt. So those roots can make good contact with that dirt and start growing into it. You don't want a lot of porous dirt under it. And if you do have a lot of porous dirt under the root ball, the whole thing could sink and your tree could get a little too low compared to the water in the soil. And now um, here is, was a, a 15 gallon ironwood tree. Look at those, the roots have hit the bottom. They've created a mat. Go ahead and pull those mats off. Don't sit there and try to elongate each one of the roots, just pull them off, rip them off, because the, the roots that remain will then have a chance to grow straight into the soil. Whereas if they're coiled, that it, it impedes their ability to grow straight into the, the, into the soil. Here you can see the root ball of the tree relative to the, the planting hole. And now it's been backfilled. It is on a slight pedestal, on a small pedestal, on a large pedestal. You'll see that in the next picture with a little tiny donut right around that raised pedestal there of water. So that's its initial watering. And um, in this case, since this was a really deep basin, and it gets, yeah, see, here's the final basin. You can see this is very deep. Here's the raised pedestal, pedestal, and there's a little mini donut in here. So direct rainfall or a little supplemental water from a hose can get right to that root ball. Okay. All right, mulch, got to have it. Um, 90 inches of evaporation loss over a swimming pool in a year's time in Tucson, we only get 11 inches of rain. So any water you put in that soil, you're gonna lose, unless you give it a blanket. If you only have direct rainfall, just put in about an inch of organic mulch. You can see there the pedestal. You don't put mulch right up to the trunk. Leave a barrier around that trunk because if you put mulch right next to it, it can retain water and get a little bit um, rotty, okay? Here you see the uh, ring of mulch around that upper donut. Here's the lower basin. Uh, I did eventually put mulch on that. So here's that finished mulch job. We can use native mulches, they're terrific. This is actually a bunch of leaves from an, um, an Arizona roadwood that I knew about that the leaves weren't being used that were on the ground, I brought it over for the mulch. Rock mulch is used, it's hot. It doesn't decompose to create a living soil. Um, it is popular, it doesn't wash away, but um, if you have a choice, organic mulch is healthier for the plants. Now you gotta have to provide periodic watering. Um, the basic philosophy is water at the drip line of a tree. Of course, if this is a tiny little seed seedling, the drip line is right there. As the tree gets bigger, you wanna encourage those roots to grow out. I've asked a number of certified arborists, well, where is the root zone of trees? And everyone I ask, I get a different answer. But they all tend to agree that if you water around at the drip line, which means where the rain drips off the outer edge of the tree, that's a, that's a reasonably good place to do it. Water deep, you do have to water to establish. Um, so the first, you know, try not to put your plants in in the hot, dry months. Not the best time to plant them. Um, if, a, if a tree normally germinates, its seeds germinate in the monsoon season, that's a pretty good time to transplant it or do it in the winter um, or late spring uh, or early spring after freeze damage has, freeze potential has passed. Lots of different ways to, to water soaker hoses, um, five gallon buckets with a hole in them. When you do go to water, 
use this sequence. First of all, collect natural rainfall. If you have a tank, let it fill up. Just let that water stay there. Um, once that tree dries out, it's got its evapotranspiration going on. The next watering source, if you have it, use condensate water because that's probably a limited time of year then you'll have that. If you have it, use it. Um, water it up. As soon as it loses that water and you need to water again, uh, use your gray water. And um, that should be a year round somewhat reliable source. If you don't have gray water, or for some reason it's not a, you know, I don't know, you haven't done any laundry that week, go ahead and use your tank water if the tree needs the water. And when the tank's empty, you can, you have a choice. You can let this tree do what it does naturally, which might be to go a little bit drought deciduous um, if it's a low water use tree. Um, and just see how much of that you can tolerate. It might self prune, it might drop leaves. Um, if it's a low water use native, it'll probably make it except in its early years, you, you don't wanna stress them out then. Um, or if you want to maintain the dense shade and the aesthetics, use potable water. But um, we like to recommend that you use potable water as a last resort. And that's where you win the argument. Wait, we can't have more trees because we're gonna, we don't have any water. Well, yeah, we do. Yes, we do. You know, you may, you want to use potable to save them. I mean, it's worth it. You've invested a lot, but clearly that's just a completely different strategy than throwing a drip system on this tree and walking away, right? Okay. Pruning. Here's a nice well-pruned right of way. Um, when should you prune? You should prune only if you absolutely have to. And then so people can walk by the tree. Um, if you have dead branches like this, if it's obstructing traffic, if you're in a wildfire, wildfire prone area and you need to prune up, you know, to get your canopy high. Um, or uh, that's about it. That's probably the only reasons you really need to prune. If you want to get under the tree, like you want a picnic table under there to, for shade. But remember that the, the wounds don't heal, they seal. So the best time of year to prune would be in late winter when the trees are typically are more dormant and you can see their structure better. And um, the, the, the risk of fungal activity is a little lower late in winter than it is early in winter. And um, you can prune you know, later in the season if you want to, if you get a bunch of growth um, and you need to thin it out a little bit, you can do it later in the season. But for big heavy duty prunes, um, where you're you know, removing up to 20, 20, 20 to 25% of the tree, don't take more of that at one time. Do that in uh, late winter. And here are some just quick remarks on pruning. When you prune, think of this as a fire hose. Okay, water, literally water is going up these. If you're gonna cut off this part of the hose, it's like kinking the hose. So now that water is gonna to wanna to reroute itself. In this case, you've got a nice fat branch that water can reroute. In this case, you're cutting off that part of the hose and, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's gonna to try to reroute up this branch that's really too thin for it. So don't bother, prune, prune there to channel the water back up that main trunk. Okay, so you don't leave behind these scrawny little branches and, and expect them to be able to reroute the water. Um, next, don't prune at an angle. That creates a big wound. That's more wound that the tree has to seal. Even though it might look a little funny, funnier to you, prune perpendicular to the pattern of that branch. And if you have a big heavy limb, there's a three cut method here. You can read more about that. Um, here is a good prune. You have left this part of the tree that helps to do the ceiling, that part you wanna keep. If you cut there, you've removed part of the healing of the, the ceiling ability of that limb. On the other hand, don't leave, leave these stubs sticking out. The tree's gonna kill those anyway. There's nowhere for that water to go. 
So the tree is going to self seal and drop these. Just cut them off to begin with. Just cut them off. All of these are dying because there's nowhere for the water to route. Really important point, only prune what you have to prune. Here's a desert willow. This is its width. This, right, excuse me, well, I don't know how you wanna put it. This is how wide it is. This is the other dimension of width where it has to be pruned to have access to the road and to clear this roof, but there's no reason to prune it left or right because that just creates shade. There's nothing, why, why remove that? That's really important to just leave that there. And by the way, if um, cut your prunings, if it's a half an inch diameter or less, cut it into like little four inch pieces and press it into the soil under the tree as mulch. Don't just throw it on there like a heap, press it into the soil. Okay, here's just an example of a sequence. Take your time when you prune, think it through, start small, start toward the bottom, remove what you think should start to go and then rest. Look at how the tree adapts to that. Some of those branches might whip back up because the weight has been reduced and you might not have to prune them. So you work in, take a look, work in again, take a look, work in again, work in again till you have the access you need and leave the rest because you want the shade. And finally, you will often see on native trees, these, this epicormic growth, like uh, branches growing out of trunks. Some people think that's messy. Actually, those trees are shading their trunks. That's a good thing. They're creating more shade on the ground. They're creating more shade on their trunks. You know these trees like to have their trunks shaded. Leave it there. Don't do this because this is what happens. This is a sunburned Palo Verde. Stream pruning occurred and this damage happened very quickly right after that, even in the winter. So um, Palo Verdes are very delicate that way. All native trees are, are affected by that extreme pruning and they don't, they don't fulfill their function when they're pruned like that. And don't shear. This is a creosote that has been sheared. It really distorts the growth pattern gets very rangy underneath that very thick mat. So avoid shearing and enjoy the benefits of native trees because there's a lot of them. And that's the end. <laughs> Here's the resources. This is a very, very old um, desert ironwood tree growing at, look at the trunk on that tree. This is, um, let me see here, four feet is 12, let's see. I was, the circumference was 10 feet around. I walked around the tree and I think the canopy, <laughs> the canopy diameter is 55 feet from there to there, terrific tree. Okay, here's a poster. You can get this at this website. You can print it as an eight and a half by 11 um, or have it blown up if you'd like. These are all native tree characteristics. Okay, questions and announcements. Well, thank you, Anne. I'll, I'll put the first question in, if I can find it. It's to do with the, the um, pruning perpendicular to the branch. Can you, is that always going to be the case that you want to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, I know it looks funny sometimes, mm -hmm. but um, when you, if you did this, if you did this like, oh, look, I can just cut that big ankle, angle and it'll look really smooth going up. You create a big wound on the tree. Mm. Insects, fungus, um, things like that can attack the tree in that wound. And it takes more effort for the tree to seal the wound. So yes, you know, go per perpendicular and don't leave these stubs. Okay. Now, Abby asked about getting these slides, and I just put into the chat that all these slides are, they're essentially a PDF, and they're this available. Is a, this exact presentation yes. is at that website. You can go download it as a PDF. Um, since it's a PDF, that means if you, if, you, if you were to watch it like it was a slideshow, it would scroll. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't 
jump from slide to slide, but that's that's pretty easy to do. And I know there's a lot of words on some of these slides and I didn't go through every word. You can go back to it and take your time and read all those details. I kind of have to hit the high points to get through this in an hour. Yeah. Yeah, so Abby, you've got two of us put the, the information in the chat box as well. So have fun. Now, you talked about pressing the cut um, little branches that are less than half inch diameter, pressing them into the soil. And I've just been laying them like wood chips around the base. What's the difference? Yeah, lay them flat. I mean, the point of that is you don't just take all these raggedy prunings. Sometimes they're kind of big and awkward and throw them under a tree because then you have this sort of heap that some people think is unsightly. Uh -huh. Plus, it's not really benefiting the soil because it's not in contact with the soil. So, you know, what, what we really mean is just lay them flat in the, in the bottom of the basin. Okay, you don't have to get obsessive about it, but, you know, get them down there so that when the rain comes, they, they really start to have more contact with the soil so they can decompose and the insects can reach them and chew on them and, and uh, it shades the, the soil under the plant better. Don't, don't create big heaps and everybody goes, oh, what a mess. You know, we have enough to deal with <laughs> without creating what other people to perceive to be a mess. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So we've got time for a few more questions. Please um, feel free, this is a small enough group, you can just unmute and ask a question or pop it in the chat. I have a question. It does. Yes, um, about the velvet mesquite, it, does that tree, I'm not too familiar with the different types of mesquite and their names. Does the velvet mesquite have the really long spiky thorns? No, that's a Texas honey mesquite. Well, oh, that's um, honey. That's a Texas honey mesquite and, you know, with the like really impressively huge thorns. Yes. Um, those are uh, native farther east of here, more into the Chihuahuan desert. Mm -hmm. um, they do grow well here. However, they have very shallow root systems and they tend to get very top heavy. And those are the kind that, nah, you know, they're, they're a little bit prone to blowing over in the wind and they do get under sidewalks and heave them up. I've heard of people having to, having them heave under their houses, under in the foundations under their houses, like their house slabs. So they're, you know, they're big shady trees, but they're a little problematic. The native velvet mesquite, and if you wanna see one of those, um, the tree, the mesquites around Old Main at the university, those are old velvet mesquites. So those are big. The big ones tend to get a, a little bit of a, the canopy gets a little thinned out when they get really old, but that's one place to see the natives. And you can, you can go anywhere and feel, feel the underside of the leaves. Right. If they're not velvety, it's not a velvet. There's Chilean mesquites and, you know, there's South American mesquites that are very frequently used here because they grow fast. They, um, they have big, pretty dense shady canopies and they have a taller stature quicker than some of the velvets, um, but they have those other problems, which is the another kind of problem. invasive roots and yeah. Another, another problem with the, with the other non-native, mm -hmm. like the honey mesquite, is those thorns are very dangerous. Yeah. And people step on them and, and they'll puncture a shoe or a no. They're nasty. You've ever tried to trimming? I tried trimming one of those once, and it was just awful. Yeah. I mean, it was it was terrible to try to ma manage that tree, and yeah. the, even the the limbs still have a lot of thorns on them. You know, it's not just the the leafy branches. Yeah. So, I think, yeah. Yeah. I think those should not be allowed to be planted in parks or actually anywhere really within <laughs> city, within city limits. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty. Pretty, pretty intimidating trees. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well. I'm trying to think if there was one other thing that came in my mind, but I don't remember what it is. So we'll let it go. Well, um, why don't we, there might be another question. Can we pause? I think Paula has one or two announcements okay. to make. Okay. 
Well, we've got a couple of questions from Richard and I have one as well. Oh, great, go ahead. Richard. Okay, I just uh, want to say, uh, and thank you so much for this presentation. I wish every tree in Tucson was planted like you laid this out in your document. I have a fear that not all the trees that we are planting in Tucson are planted like this. A lot of times they're planted, you know, uh, in raised areas and not harvesting water from the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you developing this. I can tell there's a lot of thought that went into the, your document and what you presented. And it's, I think it's just fantastic. And I wish every person who was planting a tree in Tucson uh, would get this material. Um, I have a little, a couple of little quick comments. One is, uh, I think the Argentinian and the Chileans have very big thorns when they're young. Uh, the honey mesquites uh, sometimes have big thorns when they're young as well but they also have the best tasting mesquite pods in terms of eating mesquite, uh, to me anyway, uh, even better than a lot of the velvets, especially the hybridized velvets. And then my other uh, comment or question is, there's been some changes in terms of planting uh, mesquites in terms of basins. And, um, you know, when I look at Brad's house, I see, trees planted near the bottoms of the basins. When I look at Treat Avenue, north of Speedway, I see trees planted the old way, which is in the basins and trees planted on top of the basins. And wouldn't it be a great experiment if we could do a study where we could compare the trees that were planted in the basins versus the ones that are planted next to the basins? Uh, because my concern is when the trees are young, if they're planted, uh, completely outside the basin, but next to it, that the young roots are going to be next to that sheer wall towards the basin, and they could dry out. Uh, so it, I think it would be really fascinating to do a comparison study of, you know, because certainly it's great to to harvest water and provide it for the trees, and both of those are better than putting them up on top of hillocks, like is done unfortunately a lot of times, but. Um, it would be really a neat study to see what the difference was in the growth rate and the longevity of trees planted in basins versus next to basins, especially yeah. uh, if we think about differences of soil, uh, where mm -hmm. sometimes soil can be deep and, and uh, you know, long, and sometimes there's caliche. Uh, so there's a lot of differences in terms of, in terms of our soils. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that is one advantage of natives is that they can they can kind of deal with a relatively depauperate condition of our soil here. I mean, I, I long time ago I lived in Iowa and that there was soil there. This is kind of like <laughs> dirt here. <laughs> yeah, but that yeah, that would be interesting to to do some, you know, a, really more of a controlled experiment to look at the difference. Does it really matter if you plunk a mesquite in the bottom? I mean, I've seen trees growing in, next to washes and they've had their roots, you know, the, the dirt has been ripped away from their roots and the roots just put bark on them. I mean, it's like, it's amazing what these native trees, how much, how much adaptations they have. By the way, the, I, I'm, I'm working with other people on the city's um, urban forest action plan and definitely water harvesting, you know, a lot of the principles you see in here will be incorporated into the recommendations that come out of that and very, very widely publicized. I mean, you know, a huge amount of outreach associated with trying to get a million trees planted in Tucson by 2030. So this information will, will certainly be, be amplified through that process. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned that one inch of mulch under a tree that just gets direct rainfall. You can put two inches of mulch under a tree that's getting runoff and direct rainfall. If you put too much mulch under a tree that just gets direct rainfall, in low rainfall events, the water won't get down to the roots. Uh -huh. So that's why thin, if it's just direct rainfall, a little bit thicker if it gets runoff and direct. Thank you, Anne. I think Trace, do you still have a question? Yeah, um, Anne, uh, the mayor has 
uh, has this million tree program. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that it's a million trees rather than a million additional trees. Uh, but um, in the parts of town where they don't have very many trees, it's probably because the owners there, whether homeowners or rental property owners, don't want to spend the money and time uh, for all the water and maintenance and stuff. And it seems to me that uh, we're going to have to put a whole lot of these additional trees uh, in the street that we're going to have to actually utilize the rainfall that runs off from the pavement. And I wonder if you could comment any on the implications or what we could do if we decided to plant a large number of trees throughout the residential streets of our neighborhoods. Well, I think um, very, you know, from sitting in on the meetings um, for preparation of this action plan, there's definitely an emphasis on getting trees planted on residential properties in high priority areas where the canopy coverage can be 2% or less. Like it's, you know, 2% is like a shrub on an, you know, one shrub on an urban lot. I mean, it's just hammeringly hot. So the outreach program will be designed to reach communities um, very sensitively and with um, equitable ec goals of creating shade canopy equity, speaking to communities in a way that they're receptive to and assisting in ways they want to be helped to get more trees planted on private residential property. Yes, in addition, um, transportation corridors, you know, public rights of ways need to be planted. Um, commercial properties need to be addressed. I mean, to bring Tucson's tree canopy from 6% up to 15% eventually, and, and, and even the million tree goal won't reach that. Um, you know, that's, that's just a huge undertaking and there's really no bare land you can leave out of that equation to up, you know, to really start to address the urban heat island effect. And when you look at the projections that in Pima County, uh, projecting an average temperature increase of 10 degrees by 2100, so 80 years from now, 75 years from now, our average temperature is 10 degrees higher, winter, summer, day, night. I mean, that's, that's, that's mind boggling. So, you know, we got to get on top of this. We've got to, if you put a tree in the ground, it's got to have its harvested water source. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to, to a step to do this. Um, you know, I don't know, your concept is that it's not a million additional trees, it's a million plus we were, what we already have. That's not my understanding of it. Maybe I have it wrong, but the graphs I've made are for an additional million trees. Yeah, uh, Nicole uh, told oh. me that they were thinking of a million trees, not a million additional trees. Oh, I see. Well, I guess I better talk with her about yeah, that. It's a big deal. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like they're thinking that uh, you can do outreach to the parts of town that don't have very many trees, and it's uh, that will work. But I'm afraid that. It, they don't have it because they don't want to spend the money on the water. Well, and, there's that, and they don't want to take care of, some people don't want to take care of trees. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are wards where people are going door to door. They are, you know, con continually doing demonstration tree plantings. Trees for Tucson is going around frequently now doing neighborhood tree plantings. So, um, well, I think there's yeah. an opportunity uh, to uh, 
create what are known as Wunerfen or home zones, which is to transform our neighborhoods into parks mm -hmm. by slowing down the traffic and planting large numbers of trees in the street mm -hmm. where the water is. And it sounds like that's not being considered. Oh, uh, yeah, no, it's totally part of the picture. You know, okay. everything is part of the picture. The, one of the challenges of right of ways that the utilities are usually <laughs> underneath them, buried utilities are underneath them, shallow, and power lines are over the tops of them. So it's a challenging environment. Yeah, that's where the water is, but that's also where the utilities are. So that's just one of the challenges you face of trying to do it. But no, I, to my knowledge, nothing's being left out. Well, every, I mean, every well, sector. 